Let's go. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I've received your homework, and I read uh, the paragraphs. And first, I would like to thank you for the very kind things that you that you said. Many of you said nice things about this course, and I really appreciated it. I hope you all are enjoying the course and are benefiting, learning more English, and uh, also learning something about uh, the book and about the philosophical ideas that Olavo wants to have um, put forth. So thank you for your comments. Now, I read all of the uh, homework assignments. And originally, I intended to take some sentences from your writing and use them to correct errors of grammar or usage. I thought maybe there would be common errors and a pattern would arise. But as I read, I didn't really see specific sentences to use, but I did notice patterns. So let me tell you what I noticed by way of feedback. First, I was struck by the fluency of your writing. Fluency. When we say fluency about uh, spoken language, it usually means that the person can speak fast and accurately. So it'll be like fluent and no stumble, no pauses, no mm. uh, that would be spoken fluency. But fluency in writing means that it is not what we would call wooden or stilted. So wooden, not wooden or stilted. And I believe both of those words require some explanation. When we say something is wooden, we mean it is um, not flexible, uh, always the same, uh, kind of, it's almost like boring, very simple grammatical structures, all the same sentence types, very few vocabulary words, simple, uh, constrained thought. Stilted is the same way. With um, writing which is stilted, you get the feeling that the person is not able to say what is in their heart. They can only say a few things, and they have to use those few things, but they are unable to express the wide breadth of thought and emotion. Okay, Usually, student writing is stilted and wooden. And usually, writing that is fluent is produced only by very advanced students or people who are basically competent in the language. So I was impressed by the fluency. Also, I found that although the ideas you expressed were very sophisticated, very complicated, in some cases, some of you referred to philosophical ideas, which I am not familiar with. Um, some of you referred to philosophers by name that I don't know, or referred to concepts 
that Olavo teaches that I have only a small familiarity with. But in spite of the complexity of your thoughts, I feel I was able to follow and understand your writing. That means your writing was pretty good. I found that the progress, progression of content words, riding on a sea of uncertain grammar, but the content words were able to evoke understanding. And so even if the grammatical structures were not correct and the grammatical relationships were not correct, I did feel that I could understand your point. It was intelligible, mostly, and I was able to follow the gist. So that's good. However, there's a good side and a bad side to what I'm about to say. So I'll say it and then I'll say the good side and the bad side. A lot of the words were used in a slightly non-standard way. Non-standard uh, eraser. Non-standard sometimes means wrong. It is what we call a euphemism in the teaching world of English for wrong. So it, it's a euphemism, E-U, how do you spell euphemism? I think this is it. A euphemism for wrong. <laughs> Now, some of the vocabulary was used in a non-standard way. Now, that can mean it was simply wrong, but it can also mean that it was right but unusual. If it is right but unusual, it would be good to learn the usual way of saying the same thing because to use words in a non-standard way even if correct can mark you as a non-native uh, speaker and sometimes can give rise to misunderstanding although once you have full control of your writing and can write in a standard way to throw in the non-standard can give emphasis or change the meaning a little. It becomes a power for you. But first we have to learn how to say things in the standard way. I'll give you an example of that from the writing. Um, somebody said, um, Levis asseverates that criticism is the doorway through which we can share thought. So he says, Levis asseverates. Now I had to look up this word to be sure it was a word. Um, it is very unusual. Usually we would say, Levis asserts that. So that's one small example of, um, you know, an unusual choice. But this is correct. It's just not very common. And uh, there were lots of things like that 
in your writing, as well as some vocabulary that was wrong and some vocabulary, I mean, sorry, some grammar that was either non-standard or wrong. So I have uh, a suggestion. Um, this is a strong suggestion. I think you should do this. I suggest that once a week, every week, you spend some time copying a piece of literature or an essay or something in English. If you, um, this would be the procedure you would use. If at all possible, get something that you have an audio text for, if possible. So you read the text, you listen to the text, maybe even discuss it. If you have anyone who speaks English, uh, you can discuss the ideas. Um, and then you sit down to copy the essay or the piece. When you copy the piece, a few things will happen. First, first, as you copy, at first, you will have to look very frequently. Some people have to go almost word by word or even check letters of spelling. So you are looking and you are writing and you are looking and you are writing. But the longer you do this, the more your brain will be able to retain. So instead of looking letter by letter at times, it may be word by word. From word by word, it becomes phrase by phrase, and you are writing phrases. Before you know it, you are writing an entire clause, an entire dependent clause, including, you know, two or three phrases. And then, next thing you know, you are writing sentences from memory. What happens is your brain begins to organize the language and be able to retain more. And when you get to the point that you can write complete sentences, holding them in your mind and punctuating correctly, you'll be ready to write in a university class English. So what you're doing is training your mind to write in standard English, correct English, standard English. So the first thing that happens is you pattern your mind, and that is very good. And in fact, it is almost indispensable to do copying. Indispensable means you cannot learn without it, pretty much. It's a very powerful exercise. Okay. Second thing that will happen when you copy is you will notice grammatical relationships that you did not consciously notice when you listened or even when you read. Because when you listen and when you read, your mind is busy constructing ideas and your mind gets the content. The grammar is a structure that holds the content, but it is somewhat invisible to your brain. You don't notice it. It is like the frame of a picture. You don't look at the frame of the picture. You look at the picture. But when you go to copy, 
you will have to reproduce the frame. And all of a sudden you will say, what did that frame look like? And you'll take a second look. Oh, the frame has a pattern. The frame has a border. The frame is in two colors. You will notice the frame if you must reproduce it. In the same way, the grammar will become your focus when you are writing. And the details will begin to stand out to you. And you will say, oh, I didn't realize that he was saying in the street instead of on the street. You'll say, I never noticed. I wonder why it's in. I thought it was on. Or you might notice, um, you might notice the addition of a, a n before before words that begin with a vowel sound, and you may notice that the n is added even if the following word does not begin with a vowel. For example. You may notice that in the phrase an hour, you have an N. And in the phrase a horse, you don't. And you'll say to yourself, hmm, is it a mistake in the book? Why? Why N here and not here? How am I supposed to know that? And eventually you'll discover, well, if there is an N, that is a clue to pronunciation. In this word, the H is not pronounced. Therefore, it begins with the O-U, our. In fact, this word, our, which means the time on the clock, the hour on the clock, this word is pronounced exactly the same as this word, our. This word is the pro possessive plural pronoun, our book. It means belonging to you and me, more than one person, our book. Our. So, as you copy, you will notice things about the language which you didn't notice when you listened, maybe even didn't notice when you were reading for content. Because when you are copying, every letter matters, every uh, punctuation mark matters and it will raise questions for you. And those questions you can send to me. And then I will feel that I am useful to you. When you send me a question and you say, I was copying and I noticed that in one place, two sentences were joined with a semicolon. A second. It was hot. I sweated buckets. And in another place, two sentences were joined by a colon. Um,
I don't know how to spell Balzac. Um. The books were edgy. Balzac was indecent. And so you'll write me a, or maybe you'll even notice another one where they are joined with, with this. Um, I was scared. I hate spiders. So why are these various ones chosen? So you might send questions like that or any sort of question you come up with. So what I would like, this is not assigned as a homework assignment, but I strongly suggest to you that you choose some passage out of literature or an essay or anything you want and do copying every week. And if you will send me the name and description of what you are copying, I will feel happy and I will tell the other students what you are doing. And you can encourage one another and give ideas to one another this way. So I recommend that you copy something every week. This is a, an indispensable exercise and discipline for a serious language learner. And as you do it, I think you will find that your writing becomes better and better. And I think after what I read of your homework assignments, that this is the best thing for you to do. Okay. Let us uh, go on to the book. Let me erase the board first. And if you have any questions or comments, you can chat them. We have Alessandro watching the chat board. And uh, so always, we are always open to your feedback during the class if you want. Okay. We stopped last week on page 28. I believe we stopped in the middle of the page right before the uh, second extended quote. So, I think I would like to back up a little bit. I want to remind you that we are speaking of an inconsistency in Andreski's thought originally. A page or two back, Levis pointed out that Andreski had an inconsistency in his thought. He was making a distinction in his thought between science, fact, versus uh, subjectivity. And this would be more in a morals or ethics or realm, something like that. While Andreski did um, rely on this distinction, he seems to believe in this distinction. However, the distinction does not follow in the thread of his arguments. And so Levis was pointing out that perhaps Andreski has not thought deeply enough 
about the topics he is speaking of. Remember, Levis likes Andreski. Levis appreciates Andreski. And therefore, he criticizes him, I think he said appreciatively or gently. Um, he considers Levis, I'm sorry, Andreski, an ally in the big picture, because Andreski is pointing to the same cultural and academic problems that Levis is pointing to. So they are allies on the same side of the war. However, they are not the same. Andreski has some philosophical presuppositions that Levis would like to cast further light upon. So I think I will, uh, oh, I also want to remind you that objectivity was considered an ideal. A value. In other words, everybody these days seems to agree that this is where it's at. And this, you can say anything you want. It has no objective reality, no truth value. What's good for, for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. There is no truth on this side of the board. All truth resides on this side of the board. That is what the prevailing thought of our day is, and this is what the prevailing thought in 19, the 1950s and the 1970s, this idea was being put forth. So keep this in mind. Now, I would like to read the two paragraphs that we have already finished on page 28 and then continue on with the new portion. This will give us a running start. I don't really like to begin right where we are because it's out of context. So let's, I will read, uh, beginning with the words, actually the ideal. And uh, then we will focus on the new material afterwards. Okay, so just listen to the fluency of the language and let your brain enjoy it. You should already know this material well enough that you should be able to understand very well without too much effort. So here we go. Actually, the ideal of objectivity cannot be what Andreski represents it as being. Cannot. And if the distinction, as he posits it, is one of the cornerstones of philosophy, then it is certainly imprudent to commit oneself to living in the edifice. Hume and Russell, a philosopher whom he adduces with avowed sympathy, are not sufficient authorities regarding the nature of objectivity. And the student of English ought to be able to say so with well-founded conviction. I touch here on the theme of English as a liaison center, a theme entailing the postulate that the main intellectual disciplines should be co-present in a university, but that a belief in the possible profit of such co-presence is not a belief in mixed, mixed courses or in seminars on Wittgenstein for literary students. The presence of philosophy in the university should be important for English. The profit would accrue in the fields of both disciplines. 
I had better add at once that I cannot think of it as involving, for English, a dependence on authoritative advice from the academic department of philosophy. Before offering to justify this immodest proposal, I'm sorry, immodest avowal, I will quote another passage from Andreski's chapter and make the commentary it invites. If there are any questions about those two paragraphs, go ahead and send them in. I would love to go over them again. Every time we're here, I think of things we didn't say last week, but that always will be the case. So now I am going on. Even today, the spontaneous approach of anybody who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment, as it were, from the outside, remains emotional and manipulative. And the overwhelming majority of pronouncements on human affairs are made either for the sake of giving vent to emotions or influencing other people's behavior. The latter can be achieved either by direct command or by imbuing people with appropriate sentiments or by instilling into them beliefs about the existing circumstances and causal relations between them which will induce them to behave in order to satisfy their desires. Normally, when we speak about human conduct, we condemn or praise, persuade or promise, threaten or cajole, and to be willing and able to discuss social behavior dispassionately and without an immediate utilitarian aim in view remains a hallmark of sophistication, uncommon even today, and the first glimmerings of which appeared in the writings of Machiavelli. Let's go over this from the start. Okay, first phrase, even today. Question, what is he talking about, even today? Why does he even throw that in? If anybody knows, why don't you write it to us on the chat? Because I'm going to be erasing. Why did he write even today here? I'm interested in whether you know. Anybody have any ideas coming through, Alessandra? No, Any ideas? When I read it, it seemed to me a non sequitur, but not really, because as a phrase, it means something to the native speaker of English. Literally, it, uh, it wouldn't mean much. So, the even today it has a um, sort of an emotional connotation meaning. Um, it means in our advanced age. The idea is that we are developed from a point of view of civilization. We are civilized, intelligent, modern, evolved people. We are not cavemen. <laughs> we are not savages. We are not medieval, uh, crazy people. <laughs> We are advanced, and yet 
dot, 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 we still do X, Y, Z. So even today suggests that in our advanced day and age, you would expect a certain kind of thought or behavior. However, even today, we still do the same stupid things that were done in the medieval days, in the dark ages, in ancient times, whatever. So even today brings forth the idea that we are advanced, yet still we are doing something that maybe isn't good. So that is what you begin with in this phrase. Okay. What follows is a complicated sentence. The first thing to do is to find the skeleton, the main subject and verb. So, even today, the spontaneous approach of anyone who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment, as it were, from the outside, remains emotional and manipulative. And the overwhelming majority of pronouncements on human affairs are made either for the sake of giving vent to emotions or influencing other people's behavior. The core of the first uh, independent clause is the approach remains emotional and manipulative. The cut something out, approach remains I think I cut something else out. Uh, approach, big cut out right there, big cut out. The approach remains emotional and manipulative. Okay, first of all, I want to point out that in this paragraph, these two concepts, yes, these two concepts are extremely key themes. Key themes. throughout the paragraph. The paragraph comes back to these two concepts at least three more times, um, at least three times in the paragraph, maybe four. So keep in mind that this paragraph speaks of two things, emotional and manipulative, both uh, pejorative. Uh, I want you to get the word pejorative. P-E-J-O-R-A-T-I-V-E. -E. Both handled pejoratively. That means the author doesn't like these things. These are considered bad. It would be like calling someone dirty. That's pejorative. Whereas if you call them clean, it's nice. <laughs> okay, so pejorative means bad. So you take a, for example, you take a neutral concept and imbue it with negative connotations. And then you are using it pejoratively as a criticism or as an insult. Okay, so the first thing to realize with this paragraph is that the core of the first phrase, the first independent clause, introduces the two key themes. Also, we have the question of the word approach. Now, the word approach usually means to come near, 
to come near to something. To approach the bench means to physically walk up to it. Approach means to come near, usually. However, in this case, it has a different meaning. Um, in this case, it means the attitude that one brings to an argument or the strategy that one employs in making, uh, in, in achieving a task. For example, if I, if I had to um, build a house, my approach would be first to study the um, house styles on the internet to try to decide what kind of house I wanted. Second, I would look for a company that could build this house for me. Thirdly, I would hire somebody to do it. My approach would be, I would never pick up a hammer and a nail, never. My approach would be to find a person to do what I wanted done. However, Someone else's approach would be to write a plan of what they wanted, to go and purchase materials, and to come back and begin to saw the wood and frame the house and build it themselves. Their approach would be hands-on. My approach would be hands-off. So approach means style or strategy of, uh, of how you will accomplish something. Okay, so the approach or the strategy of a person who does all this stuff or who is all this, the approach remains emotional and manipulative. Now, remains is a linking verb here. And it keys back into that first phrase. Even today, their approach remains emotional and manipulative. So even today, when we advanced and enlightened people know that it is bad to be emotional, emotional and manipulative, even today, most people's approach remains, just like the cavemen, emotional and manipulative. Okay? So, from this core sentence, we can get the idea that to have an emotional approach to whatever task fits in these boxes, and a manipulative approach is something from the past, something from the dark ages, something that we as advanced, sophisticated people should have left behind. It is pejoratively used, it is bad, and we should know it. Okay. So we know that much from the core sentence. Let us add some details by looking at what's in these boxes. Okay, even today, the spontaneous approach, okay, this one is spontaneous, okay, the spontaneous approach, spontaneous means um, immediate, in the moment, without preparation, without forethought. It can even mean um, visceral, uh, something that just jumps out of you, automatic or instinctive. Okay? The, and I think in this context, it probably means unstudied, the natural approach. Okay? And then here. What goes in here is a very long phrase, a dependent clause. 
Okay, the spontaneous approach of anybody who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment, as it were, from the outside. Okay, now, this is the subject, essentially, of the action. This is the person or they, the group of people whose approach remains emotional and manipulative. Okay, so this we will look at more carefully right now, but keep in your mind where it fits in the sentence. The core sentence is, the approach remains emotional and manipulative. Whose approach? These people's approach. So keep in mind that everything I'm about to write fits in here in the, in the structure, overall structure of the sentence. Okay, so who are we talking about? We are talking about anybody for that read everybody who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment I think I'm going to stop there because I'm out of board space. What I really should do is bring a second board so that I can keep one up and put the other on top. Let's look at what we have so far, and I regret not getting the rest of it because it all goes together. Okay, anybody, meaning everybody, and generally speaking, when a person paints with a broad brush, it can be prejudicial. Um, surely not everybody does any one thing. So when he says everybody, it's kind of dismissive. It gives you an, a feeling of his emotional attitude toward these people. He uh, does not respect them that much. Everybody. Okay. Uh, who has made no special effort? He could have said who has made no effort. Special effort means particular. Um, however, I also, as a native speaker, I am getting a feeling of contempt. Um, when in common speech, when I am angry with my son for not cleaning the house, I might say, well, it doesn't look like you made a very special effort to do this. I'm not quite sure why, but special effort, I can't really explain why, but it, it's part of saying, what's the matter with you? You haven't done anything. <laughs> you haven't done it. So he hasn't made any special effort. He isn't especially interested. He doesn't especially care. 
Somehow the word special and especially uh, emphasize the nonchalance with which these cretins bumble around the world making no special effort to learn anything. No special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment as it were from the outside. That's the part I didn't write. So, he is talking about ignoramuses. He is talking about people who he considers to be thoughtless and uncritical and who have never had a sociological thought cross their mind. They have made no special effort to accustom themselves to viewing their social environment objectively. Uh, as it were from the outside, I'm going to write it up, to viewing his social environment, comma, as it were, comma, from the outside. It's not really a period. Okay. So, anybody who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment, as it were, from the outside. The literal meaning is a person, any person, who is not trained in sociology. To make a special effort to accustom one's self to viewing their social environment, as it were, from the outside, would probably require an academic degree in sociology. Because why else should a person accustom themselves to viewing something that they are inside of from the outside? Usually an insider has a good perspective for viewing and evaluating what he sees. Seeing as an insider is valuable. Valuable. But this sentence suggests that the educated person removes himself and becomes a third party viewer, views it from the outside. This is a move toward objectivity, which, as we remember from the beginning of class, is the value. When I say the value, sometimes in English we'll capitalize it, the value. Even though not at the beginning of a sentence. I spoke of the value. That implies it is the only value or the main value, okay? Objectivity is the value. Okay, so so he has made no special effort, which means he is remiss, remiss. That means negligent. He should have made a a special effort. He is culpable. Okay. He has made no special effort to accustom himself. Accustom himself suggests that the cavemen and the medieval savages and untrained human nature would rely on their insider perspective. They would see what they see. They would form their own conclusions from within. That's what savages do. Not highly evolved, sophisticated people. Highly evolved, sophisticated people make a special effort to accustom themselves to viewing their social environment, as it were, from the outside. 
Now, this is a very interesting phrase. I knew what it meant, but it was hard for me to explain. So I looked it up, and I found out that the people who use this phrase the most are philosophers. It's used, if I'm remembering correctly, 21 times in a single essay of some philosopher. I can't remember which. I can't remember. But it was a short essay by some philosopher using this phrase or a variant of it 21 times. What it is, is it is a phrase which signals that what follows is metaphorical, not literally true. So, in this, it, in this case, as it were, from the outside. From the outside is not literal. Only figurative. Only a metaphor. Now, what the philosophers use this phrase for is to protect themselves from their own strong words. They use it to create a hedge, to um, take a step back from their own point. Usually, they'll use it when they are not real sure that the next words they say won't be taken wrong or won't offend or won't give the wrong idea. So they use this phrase to give a little wiggle room for interpretation. So someone can say, oh, he doesn't really mean that. He only means that it's like that. It's kind of like that. So that's the meaning of this phrase. It Literally, it signals that what follows is a metaphor and isn't really true. It's kind of true. It's sort of true. So the subject of our core sentence is people, anybody, who has made no special effort because he's stupid and an ignoramus and unthoughtful and uncritical to accustom himself to viewing his social environment as it were from the outside. So basically you could say if we wanted to summarize this into our core sentence it would be unobjective people. So let's rewrite our core sentence and put that in just so we see what we're talking about. Even today, the spontaneous approach of unobjective people, wait, misspelled people. remains emotional and manipulative. Even today. Okay, so much so good. Even today, the spontaneous approach of anybody who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment, as it were, from the outside, remains emotional and manipulative. And, okay, and is connecting two independent clauses. So we have another independent 
claws a whole new thought. And the overwhelming majority of pronouncements on human affairs are made either for the sake of giving vent to emotions or influencing other people's behavior. All right, I want you to remember a bit about unobjective people as the subject and the two key themes of emotional and manipulative, both used pejoratively. Remember that. Also the spontaneous approach, uncritically thought of. I'll erase it and we'll put up the second half and I think you'll see that the second half echoes the first very closely. Um, and the overwhelming majority uh, by the way I can't resist can't resist pointing out that when he talks about the overwhelming majority, he is painting with a broad brush, which can be prejudicial, just like saying anybody or everybody, they all are that way. It's categorizing a big group as though they were homogenous. That's prejudicial. And here, the overwhelming majority is the same kind of a feel. It's like everybody is doing this. The overwhelming majority. I mean, there may be a few little smart people who don't do it, but really, they're all doing it. Okay? Overwhelming majority echoes the uh, broad brush uh, comments uh, of the first bit. Okay. The overwhelming majority of pronouncements. This is another negative pejorative kind of feel for it. Pronouncements on human affairs um, are made either for the sake of giving vent to emotion influencing other people's behavior. Okay, first I want to ask you to think for a moment. When he says pronouncements on human affairs. Pronouncements on human affairs. What do you think he means? Pronouncement is an interesting word. Uh, it carries two connotations in separate directions. Uh, either it's good, it's used positively, or it's used pejoratively. If it is being used positively, it is something very weighty, like the words of the Roman Catholic Pope spoken ex cathedra. That would be a pronouncement. Pronouncements are given by a king. The king has made a pronouncement that all subjects must 
uh, bow to a statue of himself. A pronouncement is something that is um, weighty and authoritative and comprehensive and binding. It's a serious declaration. That's its literal positive meaning. Or, used pejoratively, it's something you say to your wife when you are trying to put her down and criticize her for being too controlling. So you say, well, she says, uh, will you please pick up your laundry? And you say, well, if you're going to keep making these pronouncements, I think I'll leave. You're suggesting that she is speaking out of turn, that she is putting herself high, that she is trying to exert um, more authority than she has and also more, um, or maybe it would be something more intellectual where someone would express an opinion and you say, well, I don't agree with that pronouncement. And you are insulting the person because you say that their attitude is too proud and too haughty and too high-minded. Uh, for their uh, level of content. So I believe he chose the word pronouncement in the pejorative sense. Uh, he's speaking of these ignoramuses who haven't made any special effort to educate themselves or to accustom themselves to viewing their social environment from the outside objectively, which is good, so they're just full of uh, deception because they're in the picture and not outside the picture. And then they make pronouncements as though they were the Pope speaking for God himself, ex cathedra. Okay, that's the feeling of this word pronouncements. That it is, um, the, it's like a, um, a baboon or a stupid person trying to speak something wise. So they're making pronouncements on human affairs. But I want to think for a second, if, if it were literal pronouncements on human affairs, who makes pronouncements on human affairs? Great philosophers. Thomas Aquinas. Um, Mother Teresa. Uh, the Pope. Um, People who are intelligent and scholarly and wise and studied make true literal pronouncements. Jesus Christ made pronouncements on human affairs when he told us what was right and what was wrong. Um, God made a pronouncement when he gave the Ten Commandments and then Moses gave it on um, tablets of stone. These are pronouncements, okay? So um, the overwhelming majority of pronouncements on human affairs, I think he is suggesting that when a journalist observes something about the culture, he is making a pronouncement on human affairs. Or when a philosopher makes a um, uh, puts forth an idea about the state of the culture. I think these are the ideas that really would fall into this category. Religious ideas, ethical ideas. When someone says we should not fund stem cell research or we should not um, limit health care for the elderly, these might be considered pronouncements on human affairs. So let's think, what is he talking about? Literally, what is he making reference to when he is speaking of the overwhelming majority of pronouncements on human affairs? It would be very interesting if he, Andreski, could give a list. A hundred recent pronouncements on human affairs from the popular media 
and from books and the news, you know, something like that, so that we could see what he's really talking about. Is he talking about uh, controversial issues like gun control or um, like crime or like compulsory education for children in the public school system? You know, are these the kinds of pronouncements he's talking about? What is he criticizing? Okay, so I think it is very valid to consider the literal reference of his descriptive phrase. If we don't consider the literal reference of someone's descriptive phrase, then we will allow ourselves to be carried along by their argument, by their propagandistic argument. So let us look at what he is saying and let us think about what it means all the time. Let's do that. So, as he says, the overwhelming majority of pronouncements on human affairs are made either for the sake of giving vent to emotion or influencing other people's behavior. Now, I want to point out that without giving any examples, he is positing the motivation of these pronouncements, whatever they may be. He says, whatever they are, the motivation was either to give vent to emotion or to influence other people's behavior. Now remember what our two key themes were. Uh, emotion which is bad, or manipulation, also bad. And manipulation is influencing other people's behavior. So here we have, again, the same key idea as in our first uh, independent clause. The first independent clause said, even today, the spontaneous approach of anybody who has made no special effort to accustom himself to viewing his social environment from the outside, remains emotional and manipulative. And the overwhelming majority of pronouncements made by these people, pronouncements on human affairs, are made either for the sake of giving vent to emotion or influencing other people's behavior. So emotion and manipulation again. This is the um, thesis of this sentence, of this uh, paragraph. All right, let's go on to the next sentence. The latter can be achieved either by direct command or by imbuing people with appropriate sentiments or by instilling into them beliefs about the existing circumstances and causal relations between them, which will induce them to behave in order to satisfy their desires. First two words, the latter. The latter. I think you know that this means the second or the last in the previous series. So the previous series said they're doing it either to give vent to emotion or to influence other people's behavior. The latter of that series is to influence other people's behavior. So. To influence other people's behavior can be achieved either by direct command or by imbuing people with appropriate sentiments or by instilling into them beliefs about the existing circumstances and causal relations between them which will induce them to behave in order to satisfy their desires. Okay, so if you want to control behavior, 
you have three expedients, three methods that you can use. The first is direct command. And remember, we are talking about pronouncements on human affairs. So, the pronouncement on human affairs, which is motivated by the desire to control behavior. Okay, so if you have an, a pronouncement on human affairs, which is motivated to control behavior, your first expedient is to directly command. So that would be the Ten Commandments. Or to um, imbue people with appropriate sentiments. Imbue. I used this word earlier in this lecture. It means to press, impress upon, to introduce, and to place upon someone. So it means to give it to them. Give them appropriate sentiments. So I'm just going to change the word imbue to give. Give them appropriate sentiments. Um, you might want to use the word evoke. Um, appropriate sentiments. For example, if uh, you're a communist and your pronouncement uh, that everybody has to um, surrender their crops, their food that they have grown, their property and assets. Your pronouncement is that all personal property now belongs to the state. And you want people not to hide it, <laughs> not to bury it, excuse me, not to retain their property because they will, excuse me, uh, it'll be hard for you to collect everything. So you have to somehow imbue them with appropriate sentiments. So you have to train the children to believe that generosity and giving uh, to the government is noble. If you want people to go to war, you will have to imbue them with patriotic sentiments or with hatred of the enemy so that they will go to war. So we want to imbue them with whatever sentiment or emotional attitude or personal value will cause them to act according to your desire. Or thirdly, and now this is the longest of them, uh, Thirdly, you can instill into them beliefs about the existing circumstances and causal relations between them, which will induce them to behave in order to satisfy their desires. I saw a movie last night. It was um, episode number two of the six wives of Henry VIII. And in it, there was a man who was being tortured in order to get him to sign a confession uh, that he had relations with Queen Anne Boleyn. It was false. They were trying to frame Anne Boleyn and get her executed. So they tried to instill in him the belief that he was being tortured because they believed he was guilty and that if he would sign the confession, they would set him free. 
So they were trying to instill in him certain beliefs about his circumstance. He is being questioned, then he is being tortured, and he can go free later. And the causal relations between them, if you sign the confession, then you will go free. So that he would sign the confession. Both circumstances they were trying to instill belief about were false. Uh, it was not true that they thought Anne Boleyn was guilty, and it was not true that they would let him go free after signing the confession. But they wanted him to believe that. Um, it was they used the same strategy with lots of people in this movie, trying they would tell them anything so that they would believe their circumstances could lead them, a behavior of theirs could lead them to a circumstance that would satisfy their desire. It didn't matter if it was true or not. It was manipulative. This is classic manipulative behavior. Um, our two key themes are emotion and manipulation. This is getting further away every minute. Manipulation. And maybe we should speak of the meaning of this term manipulation. Literally, manipulation is to physically move something. You can manipulate the bones. Or, or any physical thing can be, which can be moved with your hands is being manipulated. However, if you are controlling someone else's behavior in an illicit manner, it is called manipulation. Illicit. Illicit. Unjustified. deceptive. Okay. If you are controlling another person's behavior deceptively or in a manner which is unjustified, like by torture or by um, uh, flattery or telling them something that isn't true, whatever, in an illicit manner means an, a manner that's um, not justified by any moral law, then it is considered manipulation. If you are influencing someone's behavior in a lawful manner, in a respectful manner, uh, with truth, this is not called manipulation. It's called leadership. Leadership. Leadership is a good uh, form of influence. Manipulation is a bad form of influence in our language. Um, it's never considered good to be manipulated. It has a negative connotation. Whereas, people like to follow leadership and they feel good about it. Um, this is a good thing. This is a bad thing. But they're, they're similar. Both are influencing behavior. So, so your third possibility if you want to manipulate someone or control their behavior is to instill in them a belief about their circumstance or their various circumstances and the causal relationships between them in such a way that will induce the person to behave according to their own desire. That's manipulation. Okay. Normally, next sentence. Normally, when we speak about human conduct, 
we condemn or praise, persuade or promise, threaten or cajole, and to be willing and able to discuss social behavior dispassionately and without an immediate utilitarian aim in view remains a hallmark of sophistication uncommon even today and the first glimmerings of which appeared in the writings of Machiavelli. Okay. Uh, this third sentence echoes again our themes of emotion and manipulation. He says normally. The word normally is not nearly as um, condescending as our previous, but it's still in a broad brush suggesting that most people, just about everybody who isn't trained except for a small sector coterie of people who are sophisticated. Normally, most people, uh, when they speak of human conduct, so when they make pronouncements on human affairs, condemn or praise, persuade or promise, Condemning and praising is emotional. Persuading or promising is manipulative. Threaten or cajole, also manipulative. And, okay, so that half of the sentence uh, is reiterating a third time that most normal human nature people will um, behave emotionally or manipulatively when speaking of human conduct. And then he goes on to say, and to be willing and able. Willing is different than able. Most people aren't able but if they're, to be objective. But if they're able to be objective, maybe they're not willing to be objective. From a sociological point of view, that's a very big possibility because people don't like being objective. They like being emotional. So, to be willing and able to discuss social behavior dispassionately. Dispassionately means objectively. And without an immediate utilitarian aim in view. So dispassionately means not emotionally. And without an immediate Utilitarian aim in view means not manipulatively because the immediate utilitarian aim means you're trying to control the people for some practical purpose of your own. So without an immediate utilitarian aim in view to be able to discuss social relations non-emotionally and non-manipulatively remains a hallmark of sophistication uncommon even today. And the first glimmerings of which appeared in the writings of Machiavelli. All right, let me write this last uh, clause up so that we can talk about the vocabulary and make sure we understand uh, the force of the statement. Okay, uh, by the way, let us look at the vocabulary in the first half. Normally when we speak of human conduct, that means how people behave, and that's keying in with the pronouncements on human affairs. We condemn or praise, so that means we criticize or we laud. We persuade or promise. We threaten or cajole. To threaten means to say, I will hurt you if you don't. To cajole means to um, try to persuade by making a person feel comfortable and happy and jolly. So it would be like this. Why don't you give up smoking? Why don't you? I would just love it. You'd smell better. You'd probably get more kisses. 
you would um, attract more uh, favorable attention. You're such a handsome guy. You're such a great guy. Why don't you give up smoking? That's cajoling. You jolly the person up. You flatter them. Tell them how wonderful it is, how wonderful they are, all because you're trying to get something from them. Okay? That's what cajole means. Okay? Now, I'll write it up. And to be willing and able to discuss social behavior dispassionately. To be willing and able to discuss uh, social uh, discuss social behavior dispassionately. remains the hallmark of sophistication uncommon even today And the first glimmerings of which appeared in the writings of Machiavelli. Okay, I already spoke of the difference between being willing and being able. Able is ability. Willing is of the will. To be willing to discuss social behavior. Discuss doesn't only mean to speak with someone. It means to view it, to think of it, to understand it. Social behavior means the norms of society, like things like we spoke of before, gun control, stem cell research, compulsory public education for children, um, sexual norms of society, um, marriage and adultery and fornication and homosexuality, um, etc. To be able to discuss these things dispassionately. This is such a key word. This is a um, code word for objectivity. Objectivity, which is the value. Dispassionately, without emotion, remains the hallmark. Hallmark means signal characteristic. And it's not the, it's a hallmark. If it was the hallmark, it would be singular. Uh, sorry, I rewrote the. Uh, if it were the hallmark, it would be the only one. A hallmark. It means a characteristic which defines the uh, subject. So um, the hallmark of Protestantism is sola scriptura. The hallmark of um, communism is, uh, well, I would say it's violence <laughs> against uh, its own people. <laughs> so maybe the hallmark of, uh, I can't think what it would be, but it's the key characteristic which defines the whole. Okay, so... Being able to discuss social behavior dispassionately, values-free, 
objecti objectively remains a hallmark of sophistication. Sophistication. What is sophistication? Remember in the beginning of this lecture when I spoke of the words even today, I said it suggests that in the past people were undeveloped. They were cavemen. They were savages. They were stupid barbarians. And we have developed to a point of sophistication that we know better than to behave like those ignorant savages. Sophistication is a catch-all term for being developed, intelligent, refined, civilized. It's a very broad term. What he's saying is to be able to discuss social behavior in a values-free manner is the hallmark of sophistication. This is explicitly saying that objectivity, read values-free understanding of sociology, is the value, the value with a capital T on the V. It's the best, biggest, and only value. It's the hallmark of sophistication. If you are enlightened, you are dispassionate about social behavior. You can speak of abortion killing 20 million babies a year dispassionately. You don't go out and shoot the abortionist because you're angry. No. You just talk about statistics. You talk about whether the woman has a right to choose and whether the, uh, 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 the diseases that a woman could get from a back uh, alley abortion are worse than, you know, the health consequence of a clean hospital abortion and stuff like that. Dispassionate. Okay. So to be willing and able, see, I'm not willing. I might be able, but I'm not willing to discuss social behavior dispassionately in the sense of values free. I think it's the appropriate realm for some passion, personally. But anyway, to be willing and able to discuss social behavior dispassionately remains a hallmark of sophistication, uncommon even today in our enlightened age. Very few of us are sophisticated enough to know that social behavior, moral behavior, etc., is should be understood from an objective viewpoint. Okay. And the first glimmerings of which appeared in the writings of Machiavelli. Okay. Of which refers to the ability to see things objectively. Okay. Um, but first glimmerings Glimmerings are points of light. They're like sparkles. When it talks about the first glimmerings, the image it evokes is of a very early dawn where it's been black night. And all of a sudden, you notice for the first time a little bit of light on the horizon the, the dark sky over the horizon is a little bit less dark. A little bit, there's a little bit of light beginning to glimmer. It's the very beginning of light in a sunrise. So he's suggesting that the value of objectivity, that we now know that values are subjective and that objectivity is the way to go. That's like the full light of the sun. And the first glimmering came from the writing of Machiavelli. I don't agree with this, but that's what it says.
Um, I spoke to Olavo about this, and he gave me a couple of points. Um, he spoke of something written by Miguel Reale. Is that a familiar name? Miguel Reale. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Uh, it's um, the last letter is a E. An, an E, e and not an L. Reale. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alessandro has told me that this man is a Brazilian legal philosopher. But what I have written down here that Olavo was talking about was something like this. Um, fact would be the sociological fact um, that you observe what people are doing the behavior sociological fact plus normative reason um um, Olavo gave me the word normative and the phrase, what you should do. Um, plus a moral value. Put all of those together and you get law. Law is the union of the fact of behavior plus reasoning about what you ought to do plus moral values such as the value of human life and not to kill, you know, for abortion. Um, put these three together and you will craft an appropriate law. What good is this? Without the moral value, it's unanchored. We need the moral values. Um, Machiavelli, in political theory, came up with this concept of objectivity as distinct from values. Hume basically postulated this um, fact, value, distinction, but Machiavelli made it practical. And he is still known for ruthless, um, deceptive uh, cunning as a political strategy. Cynical use of power. Now, I have a little bit of time left, and I wanted to share something with you. This is just for you to enjoy. I hope you will enjoy it. Um, you know how this course is teaching us to read literature. And from literature we come face to face with ideas and concepts that are larger than the situation in the book. And by breaking out of our narrow conceptions through literature, we also break out of our narrow conceptions uh, as regards philosophical thought and the universe and all other types of thought. And uh, that's why literature is primary. It primes us. It uh, uh, loosens the soil and makes it possible for it to grow uh, the full range of crops. Well, years ago, 
I read a series, a trilogy, written by C.S. Lewis, uh, the Space Trilogy. And I read it when I was in college, before I was familiar with anything that we are talking about in this course. I read it because it was a good story. However, everything in the political theory that's being talked about here is sort of explored and fleshed out in this um, trilogy, this fictional trilogy. And um, I was thinking as I read the selection for today that this idea that objectivity is the value and that um, remember when we were talking about uh, the uh, pronouncements on human affairs and I said what exactly is he talking about what is the literal reference the literal reference of his phrase what is the literal reference means what is it talking about specifically sometimes people use a phrase that sounds great and it stirs people's emotions but if you look at what they're saying, it doesn't, it isn't good. It, it literally uh, would not persuade people. So there is a passage in one of these books that I want to share with you for fun. So let me tell you what this book is about, and then I'll read you the passage, okay? In the first book in the trilogy... By the way, this trilogy examines this objectivity of values distinction very extensively from the inside uh, because it was becoming big in the 1950s when C.S. Lewis was watching. He's a contemporary of Levis, and he also was watching what's happening in the academic world. In fact, he was at the same university um, as Levis. They were contemporary colleagues. So he is also responding to the same um, academic milieu that Levis is. Okay, so in this book, you have a, no, it's not this one, darn. Oh, good, I have the right one. It's this one, um, Out of the Silent Planet, first of three. There is a philologist. philologist named Ransom. Uh, Ransom. Mr. Ransom. I mean, that's his last name. A philologist is a person who studies language. So he was a college professor of language. And he was taking a long walk in the summer for months you know he took a hike across the country with a backpack in England in the summer and he was kidnapped by a mad scientist named Weston a mad scientist named Weston, who, with a friend, had built a spaceship and wanted to go to Mars. In fact, Weston had already been to Mars. And on Mars, he found that there was lots of gold lying around. They called it sun's blood. Sun's blood. And Weston's friend wanted the gold. 
He was greedy and he thought, I'll bring the gold back and I'll be rich. But Weston was more interested in the science of space travel and in the possibility of taking our human race and putting it on Mars in colonies so that if our world dies, we will live on other planets. And he thought Mars is the first and then we'll go to others and others until we seed ourselves across the universe. So Weston was the great scientist who made the spaceship and Divine, the other guy, was just a financier. So anyway, these two guys went to Mars and they discovered that Mars was inhabited by three intelligent, rational species called now, H-N-A-U, which in their language means rationality. Each of the three types of now had a different type of body and they had totally different customs. They were like animals to us, dogs, cats, and kangaroos. But each one was a rational um, species and they were ruled by an angel. And in this book, they find that heaven is actually heaven and the angels are out there and the angel of Mars is in fact Mars, the Greek god, Ares, the Roman god of that planet. And so it all puts mythology and science and spirituality and Christianity all together. Um, and uh, so Weston, when he is at Mars, meets the three species and they make him understand that he must go before the angel and give an account of himself. Now, Weston does not believe in angels and he thinks they want to bring him before their great king and he thinks they are demanding a human sacrifice because he doesn't really understand their language. So he comes all the way back to earth and kidnaps Ransom to take him back to Mars to give him over as a human sacrifice so that they can get gold and also establish colonies. But Ransom escapes and he learns the language of the planet. And in the end of the book is the passage I want to read you. In the end of the book, Weston and Divine, the other guy, have been dragged forcibly to court in front of the angel. And he asks them to give an account of themselves. And Weston stands up and speaks in a flowery kind of way that sounds really noble and really terrific. And Ransom, who is a philologist and learned the language, translates Weston's words into the common speech as best he can. And we see what the words literally mean. What is their literal reference? And as you remember, I told you, we must always think of the literal reference of the words that people are using because that will unmask a bad argument. So listen to Weston explaining his motives and Ransom turning it into simple speech because he's a new speaker of their language. So he's doing the best he can and you'll see how it plays out. So I'll read to you. It's kind of long, so sit back and try to try to imagine what's happening and try to enjoy it and um, realize the interest of this is in the language, the way Weston speaks and the way Ransom translates and how they 
show forth the meaning, the literal reference of what uh, Weston is saying in two different lights. Okay? All right. Okay. Uh, it begins with the angel whose name is Oyarsa saying, speak to ransom and he shall turn it into our speech, said Oyarsa. Weston accepted this arrangement at once. He believed that the hour of his death was come and he was determined to speak the thing, almost the only thing outside his own science, which he had to say. He cleared his throat, <clears throat> struck a gesture, and began. To you, I may seem a vulgar robber, but I bear on my shoulders the destiny of the human race. Your tribal life with its Stone Age weapons and beehive huts, its primitive coracles and elementary social structure has nothing to compare with our civilization, with our science, our medicine, our law, our armies, our architecture, our commerce, and our transport system, which is rapidly annihilating space and time. Our right to supersede you is the right of the higher over the lawyer, lower. Life, and he was going to go on, but Ransom interrupted. Half a moment, said Ransom in English. That's about as much as I can manage at one go. And then turning to Oyarsa, he began to translate as well as he could. The process was difficult, and the result, which he felt to be rather unsatisfactory, went something like this. Among us, Oyarsa, there is a kind of now who will take another now's food and things when they are not looking. He says he is not an ordinary one of those. He says what he does now will make very different things happen to those of our people who are not yet born. He says that among you now of one kindred all live together and the Hrasa have spears like those we used a very long time ago and your huts are small and round and your boats are small and light like the ones we used to use and you have only one ruler. He says it is different with us. He says we know much there is a thing that happens in our world when the body of a living creature feels pain and becomes weak. And he says we sometimes know how to stop that. He says we have many bent people, bad people, and we kill them or shut them up in huts and that we have people for settling quarrels and the bad now about their huts and about their mates and things. He says we have many ways for the now of one land to kill those of another and some are trained to do so. He says we build very big strong huts of stone and other things like the filtrigi and he says we exchange many things among ourselves and can carry heavy weight very quickly and go a long way. And because of all this, he says, it would not be a bad act if our people killed all of your people. As soon as Ransom had finished, Weston continued. Life, life itself is greater 
than any system of morality. Her claims are absolute. It is not by tribal taboos and copybook maxims that she has poured her relentless march from the amoeba to man and from man to civilization. He says, Ransom continued, that living creatures are stronger than the question of whether an action is good or bad. No, that's not right. He says it is better to be alive and bad than to be dead. Mm, no. He says, uh, he says, I cannot say what he says in your language, but he goes on to say, that the only good thing is that there should be very many creatures alive. He says there were many other animals before the first men came and the later animals were better than the earlier animals. But he says the animals were not born because of what is said to the young about bad and good actions by their elders and he says the animals did not feel any pity she began Weston I'm sorry interrupted Ransom I can't remember who she is the life force of course life said Weston she has ruthlessly broken down all obstacles and liquidated all failures. And today, in her highest form, civilized man, and in me as its representative, she presses forward to that interplanetary leap which will perhaps place her forever beyond the reach of death. He says, said Ransom, that these animals all learn to do many difficult things, except those who could not, and those ones died, and the other animals did not pity them. And he says, the best animal now is the kind of man who makes the big huts and carries the heavy weights and does all the other things I told you about. And he is one of those. And he says that if the others all knew what he was doing, they would be pleased. He says that if he could kill you all, and bring our people to live here, then our people might be able to go on living here after something had gone wrong with our world. And then, if something went wrong with this world, they might go and kill all the now in the next world, and then the next, and so on, and so they will never die out. It is in her right, said Weston, the right, or if you will, the might of life itself, that I am prepared without flinching to plant the flag of man on the soil of Mars, to march on step by step, superseding where necessary the lower forms of life that we find, claiming planet after planet, system after system, till our posterity, whatever strange form and yet unguessed mentality they have assumed, dwell in the universe, wherever the universe is habitable. He says, translated Ransom, that because of all this, it would not be a ba bad action or 
or else uh, it would be a possible action for him to kill you all and bring us here. He says he would feel no pity. He is saying again that perhaps they would be able to keep moving from one world to another, and wherever they came, they would kill everyone. I think he is now talking about worlds that go around other suns. He wants the creatures born out of us to be in as many places as they can. He says he does not know what kind of creatures they will be. I may fail, said Weston, but while I live, I will not, with such a key in my hand, consent to close the gates of the future on my race. What lies in that future beyond our present knowledge passes imagination to conceive. It is enough for me that there is a beyond. He's saying, said Ransom, that he will not stop trying to do all this unless you kill him. And he says that though he doesn't know what will happen to the creatures that spring from us, he wants it to happen very much. Weston, who had now finished his statement, looked around instinctively for a chair to sink into. On earth, he usually sank into a chair as the applause began. Finding no chair, he, and he was not the kind of man to sit on the ground, he folded his arm and stared with a certain dignity and I think I'll stop there. So, when I read that in college, I had no knowledge of anything we are talking about. But I was very fascinated by the way an argument which sounds valid, sounds plausible, sounds noble, and is persuasive and inspiring can be turned into literal language and be so poor and so foolish. I think that's what we need to be doing to the arguments that are poor and foolish in our day. So I think time for a break. Okay, we'll take a break. If you have any comments or questions, email us. And then if we don't get any, we'll sign off in a few minutes. Hello, are you still there? Okay, we have a few questions here. And I'm not sure we'll get satisfactory answers, but we'll try. First question. A student heard a TV documentary use an expression that um, sounded like this. Someone says, he is an author that has no, and then the student wrote it this way, acts to grind. That has no acts to grind. Actually, this is not acts. This is it. No acts to grind. This is an expression which means to have a secret agenda that you are trying to um, pursue. Uh, there is a story um, in our folklore. There was a boy grinding an axe, a stone wheel that you turned by hand and it went around and you press the axe against it and it sharpened the blade. And this is a lot of work. It's hard work to sharpen an axe. And 
the boy was sharpening the axe for his father when a stranger came by and said, Wow, you're a big, strong boy. You're really good at that. And uh, the boy began to feel proud, and he said, Yes, I'm an expert. And then the man pulled out his own knife or his own axe and said, Well, this one is hard to do. I don't think you are good enough to be able to uh, sharpen this one. It has to be razor sharp. I'm afraid that is beyond you. And the boy said, no, no, I can do it. Let me do it. So the boy worked and worked. All the while, the man complimented him and said, you are strong. You are skilled. I'm surprised at how good you are. When the boy had finished all the work, he was sweating, he was tired, he was sore. And he said, see, I can do it. And the man said, of course, anyone could and walked away. He was complimenting the boy and flattering him and saying how good he was because he had an axe to grind. So this phrase means uh, you are manipulating a person by using flattery and phrases that they will like because you want to get them to do something for you. You have an axe to grind. And an author who does not have any axe to grind will be objective. He has no, obje no agenda. He's not trying to get anything out of you. He's just speaking the truth. He has no axe to grind. All right. Second question. Um, the student wants an explanation of when to use the gerund instead of the infinitive in a sentence like, or a phrase like, accustomed himself to viewing something, or an, in an email when you finish, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Um, one thing to understand about English is that the ing suffix is used for many things. And um, it crops up in many places. So um, keep that in mind. With uh, ing does not always mean the same thing. It has a lot of different meanings. Now, in this looking forward to seeing you soon, or I want to accustom myself to viewing something. People tend to think it should be the infinitive form, and then you get this ing form. I have to say that sometimes it is the infinitive, and sometimes it is in this uh, ing form. And I don't know a hard and fast rule uh, to explain the difference. Sometimes it can be either one. And uh, the only thing I can say is that there is a mood of uh, in progress, present progressive with the ing, uh, that there tends to be a mood of, of something happening with the ing. But I can't really give you a good explanation of that. I will try to look it up in a book. And if I find something, we'll speak more of it next week. OK, let's see. I have not read these uh, questions in advance, by the way. So all right. Um, I'll read you the question, and it is also my first time reading the question. I have some questions, some more questions, about George Orwell's book, 1984. In this context, Wilson is imprisoned and being tortured. Quote, his body was being wrenched out of shape. The joints were being slowly torn apart. Although the pain had brought the sweat out on his forehead, the worst of all was the fear that his backbone was about to snap. 
he set his teeth and breathed hard through his nose, trying to keep silent as long as possible. What is meant by the term set his teeth? This phrase is closely connected with another similar phrase called he set his face like flint. Or it's also similar to a phrase he clinched his teeth or he gritted gritted his teeth. The word set suggests this word set and both of these phrases indicate an action of the will where you fortify yourself. So if you set your face like flint or if you set your teeth, you're going like this. You are preparing yourself to endure. It's a, it's a clenching, clenching, tightening of the muscles, pushing your teeth together. Clenched his teeth, gritted his teeth. Both of these refer to pushing your jaws together for the sake of fortifying yourself against something that will come so that you will not react. So it implies an action of the will more than a literal movement of your muscles. Although the movement of the muscles of preparing yourself often do involve tightening up all your muscles and sometimes even literally gritting your teeth. Flint is a kind of rock. It is a, it's, it's got flakes. So if you hit it, it flakes off. And um, we have flint and steel. If you hit the flint with the steel, you get sparks and you can make a fire. It's a certain kind of flat rock. And it implies you make your face blank and flat. You do not show any emotion. It's hard. It's unchanging. Blank. Flat. And hard. That's flint. Okay, another question about 1984. O'Brien, the guy who is torturing uh, Winston, is bragging about the totalitarian world he is supporting. That is the world that we are preparing, Winston, a world of victory after victory, triumph after triumph after triumph, and endless pressing, pressing, pressing upon the nerve of power. You are beginning, I can see, to realize what that world will be like, but in the end, you will do more... You will do more than understand it. You will accept it, welcome it, and become a part of it. I wasn't able to figure out pressing upon the nerve of power. I haven't read this book fully. I actually did, in high school, I did read part of it, but I don't think I finished it. Pressing on the nerve of power is not a phrase which is well known. Um, it's vivid, um, colorful speech. When we press on the nerve, uh, you know, you can think about this image as well as I can because it doesn't have a special meaning in English. Um, when I think of it, I think of pressing upon the pulse, but that's not the same as a nerve. So I'm actually not sure. 
it's not an idiom that I'm familiar with in English. The repetition of pressing, 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 uh, I don't know, it seems vivid, but I'm not sure what it means. Any thoughts uh, from you guys about pressing on the nerve? No one else seems to know either, so your guess is as good as ours. Okay, one last one. Here comes another extract. Whiston has been released from prison and has been appointed to a committee. The following is a description of his job. Quote, But there were other days when they settled down to their work almost eagerly, making tremendous show of entering up their minutes and drafting long memoranda which were never finished, when the argument as to what they were supposedly arguing about grew extraordinarily involved and abstruse, with subtle hagglings over definitions, enormous digressions and quarrels, threats even, to appeal to higher authority. What does the author mean by a show of entering up their minutes? Well, to make a show of something is to do it openly and publicly so that people will see you. Uh, generally, entering up their minutes, uh, minutes, it could mean two things, and I suspect it is one, not the other. Uh, the one I don't think it means, in fact, I'm sure it doesn't, so forget it. Minutes could mean uh, the minutes of work that they are logging in, but I don't think it means that. Minutes is a an account that you take you take notes of what you have done minute by minute in a meeting. Um, so minutes is a review of a meeting. And usually they are boring and meaningless and nobody even reads them. It's um, a picture of something that does not need to be done. Useless work. And they're making a show of entering their minutes, they're copying their notes of a meeting that already happened uh, into a computer. So this is a useless activity. And then afterwards, drafting long memoranda, which were never finished, you know, it's all useless activities, having long arguments over nothing. I think his job had no value and was just doing nothing. That's what I think it means. And the thing about minutes is someone is appointed to take notes in a meeting and then to type up the minutes to pass it around to everybody who was there so they can see what they talked about and also to give it to someone who missed the meeting so they can see what was talked about, and also to enter it into a permanent record so that you have a record of what was talked about at the meeting. That's what minutes are. Okay. Um, I think that might... Oh, wait, here's one. Last, last question that I have here. I'm reading a book called False Dawn, and in its subtitle we can read The United religions initiative. I don't know why the word religion is in plural. In this case, the word is an, is an adjective. Should it not be singular? Um, no, there's a difference. If you say religion, it means religion in general. If you say religions, it means religions specifically. Mormonism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, um, and any others. So religions in the plural means a specific compilation of many distinct organizations. So if it was the religions initiative, it is dealing with organizational denominations. Whereas if they said the religion institute, it would be an organization that dealt with uh, religion as an abstract concept. Okay? All right, I think that's it. Do we have any more, Alessandro, at this point? Okay. We'll see you next week. Try to do some copying. And if you do copying, let me know what you're copying. I'm very interested.